In this lecture, we are going to begin looking at our third module for the term, and this is where we're going to look at text. So what we're going to do in this next section is we're going to first briefly talk about what a text is, and then we're going to talk about how we are going to approach it in the next couple of weeks. We'll be focusing on myth, legend, folk tales, and folklore, and specifically the hero and the hero's journey. So for this week, let's start with the idea of what is a text. Usually when we talk about a text, and I'm not talking about a text message, I'm talking about a text in the academic terms, usually we think of common items such as books, newspapers, magazines, something printed. However, a text is defined academically as anything that conveys a set of meanings to the person who examines it. So that is very, very broad, and that's the point, is that I don't want you to limit your idea when you think of a text or even an artifact, is that it has to be something that is in print format. So what can be a text? Pretty much anything. Text can also include movies, paintings, television shows, songs, cartoons, maps, all online materials, works of art, even rooms full of people. So if we were in a classroom setting and we were all having a conversation, that we could look at and examine it as a text. In fact, this lecture that you are listening to right now can be considered a text. So basically, if we can look at something, explore it, find layers of meaning in it, and draw information and conclusions from it, we are looking at a text. So in this section, we're going to be looking at myth, legends, folk tales, and the hero's journey, and we're going to do it through a variety of different texts. So first, let's start with this idea of mythology. Um, this is from Barry B. Powell's Classical Myth, 8th edition. If you're interested in mythology, this is an excellent text for you to um, check out. But let's start. So where does mythology come from? Well, it comes from the Greek word mythos. Mythos simply means authoritative speech, and we could look at it as a plot or storyline. So a myth is a traditional story with collective importance, and that traditional is key, because traditional comes from the Latin word trado, which means to hand over, right? So a traditional story is one that has been handed over Originally, these were handed over orally from one storyteller to another without the intervention of writing. And so also these stories, the second part is that it has collective importance, meaning myths hold meaning for a group, not just for an individual. Myths are also anonymous. And again, they never have an identified author. So when we look at things such as Homer's The Iliad, this is not, well, we could argue it's a myth, but this is not, we know the author, but Homer was not the one who created the original story. The story of the Iliad following the Trojan War as, is one that had been passed down through generations. Homer was actually the first person who put it into the written form, so that's why he is attributed with it. Interestingly enough, we don't even really know who Homer was. There are many scholars who think that Homer was actually a collection of different individuals whose stories were eventually put together. But that is the idea behind the myth. Again, this traditional story with collective importance. So it's one that has been shared from generation to generation. Traditionally, when we break up mythology, there are three types of myth. We have the divine myth, which is also known as creation myths or origin stories. We have legends, and then we have folktale and folklore. Now, we're going to put a little bit of a fourth category in here uh, later on called fairy tale, but we'll discuss that a little bit more in a minute. All right, so let's start with divine myths, creation myths, or origin stories. Sometimes these are sacred in nature, and usually they are, they are there to explain how and why the world is the way it is. Our main characters in these creation or divine myths are some sort of supernatural characters, meaning they are superior to humans in power and splendor, 
even if sometimes they take human shape or form, they are not human. So think about, you know, the Greek and Roman gods. Most of them were in the form of humans, but they were not humans. Often these supernatural characters control awesome forces of nature. Their own forms can be enormous and of stunning beauty or of stunning ugliness. Sometimes they are little more than personified abstractions without clearly defined personalities. An example of this is the example of the Greek idea of victory. Victory is an abstract con uh, concept. If I asked you right now to draw victory, could you do it? No, you would probably draw something that maybe represents victory, but victory, the idea of victory is abstract. It's intangible, meaning it's not something we can reach out and grab. So what you see here, this is a sculpture. This is the winged victory of Samarath. And what we see in this is this is where the artist was trying to show what victory looked like. It's a personification, meaning it's giving it the human-like qualities. Interestingly enough, the Greek word for victory is Nike. Nike very intentionally chose that of the name of its products, right? What does Nike do? It creates sporting goods. What do you want to do in sports? You want to win. So Nike was very intentional in its name. All right, sometimes though these supernatural characters, sometimes they are fully developed individuals with personalities. Um, we can also see this in many of the Greek gods and goddesses such as Zeus. He was the ruler of the gods. We know his backstory. We know how he came to be. And there are many, many stories about his time as a Greek god. All right. So the events that usually take place in these, these divine or creation myths are in a world or a place outside of our own, especially in the creation or the origin stories. Why? These are literally telling how the world came to be. So before the world came to be, this couldn't take place in our world. Often time and space have very different meanings than what we are familiar with as human beings. The gods are often both actors in the stories and objects of veneration, similar to a religious cult. So do not get um, many of the myths confused with being religion. Remember, myths are traditional stories. Religion is a belief in the course of action that follows from belief. So these are separate. Again, usually these are these divine myths explain the world the way explain why the world is the way it is. And that's what we call an etiological tale. It explains the cause that brought the world into existence. And we're going to spend some time this week with these origin stories and creation myths. Many different cultures share the same archetype images or themes throughout. Archetype, this is an example of a certain person or thing. So an archetype that often shows up in some of these origin stories is that of a great flood. And we'll see that throughout different cultures, yet, you know, these all are different creation stories. All right, next, moving on to legend. Legends are similar to history, meaning it can be compared to human history, but it didn't actually happen. Usually they're compared to human history, usually to make things clearer or easy to understand. Legends often attempt to answer the question, what happened in the human past? And, <clears throat> excuse me. In legends, the central characters are human beings. However, they are not normal, everyday human beings like you and I. They are our heroes and heroines. Often we're going to see they're either part of the, Arist uh, the, Arist the Aristotelic class, the upper classes, or the very, very lower classes, and they rise. Usually they have extraordinary physical and personal qualities. They're stronger, more beautiful, or more courageous than ordinary people. So they're human, but they have something that makes them a little more. Legends take place in our own time, though they took place in the distant past. Usually, again, they, control, they contain an element of historical truth. And we'll see some legends that do serve a specific etiological function. 
meaning how a specific aspect of the world came into existence. So you can see here from the image I have um, a legend that I'm referring to, and I'm referring to King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. So Arthur is our main character. Now Arthur, no matter what adaptation you look at the story, what can he do that's extraordinary that no one else can? He's the one that can either pull the sword out of the stone or even some stories adaptations have him pulling it out of a body of water. Most of them call the sword Excalibur. And that is what makes him different. That's what makes him special. One of the key of the King Arthur archetype is that, you know, that's the true king is the only one who can grasp the sword. And you see it as different ways in different legends. So in the Disney version, The Sword and the Stone, right, Arthur is a young squire who's trying to help out the knight. And something happens to the knight's sword. Basically, he's got to find another one for him. And he goes and pulls the sword out of the stone so he doesn't get in trouble. There are other versions, um, a more recent one, a movie where we see Arthur as this, you know, hardened warrior and he becomes, he gets hold of the sword. And so we'll see the story can be different in a lot of ways, yet some of those main elements still have to be there. Some of the King Arthur stories have magical elements such as Merlin, others do not. Other examples of legends, Robin Hood, you know, Robin Hood takes steals from the rich and gives to the poor. That is the common theme. Uh, the legend of Blackbeard the pirate. So these, we seem to be able to place them in time and sometimes even location, but they did not historically happen. Now the short little article I have you had you read also says, legends refer to anything that inspires a body of stories or anything of lasting importance or fame. Now this I think is a little bit too broad of a definition because we could apply that to almost any of these myth, legends, or stories. So an example of this is I often have students claim that Romeo and Juliet is a legend. Romeo and Juliet is not a legend. We know when it was written and then it was written who it was written by, right? This was written by Shakespeare. Um, now is it a story that's been handed down or a story that adaptations have been made? Yes, but it doesn't fit the qualities that we know of a legend. Our characters aren't, do not have um, something that makes them more special than other humans. And we know the exact time and place when this, when this story took place. So why Romeo and Juliet is something that is often adapted, it is not a legend. All right, next we're going to move to folk tale or folklore. And then the common theme in this, folk, right? The, the folks, these are the people. So these are the common tales of the people. Now this category gets a little more difficult to define. Why? Because it's kind of almost everything else. Uh, traditionally, these are a variety of traditional stories that are grouped together. Any traditional story that's not a divine lift divine myth or a legend. Um, so you can see this is a very broad category. Traditionally they are just there to entertain or sometimes they have a moralistic message for us. An example of this would be Aesop's Fables. Many of you have probably heard of this. Um, the story of the tortoise and the hare. What is the message of the tortoise and the hare? Slow and steady wins the race. So it has something to teach us. Some scholars put fairy tales into this category, why others do not. In folk tales, our central characters are human beings. They are the ordinary men, women, and children. And so when we think about that, the folk tale, literally it's a tale about the ordinary folks. No one believes these are true, right? The tortoise and the hare, no one believes that, you know, a rabbit and turtle actually went and had a race. Our main characters are, be, are often somehow being persecuted or victimized in some way. Some, you know, think of the Cinderella. You can see the image I have here. This is a type of folk tale or folklore. You know, in almost all the Cinderella stories, somehow she's being bullied. Why it's with, by a stepmother or a stepmother and stepsisters or some other characters. And often our folk tales end bringing about a reversal of fortune, meaning this is our happy ending. Or at the beginning, things aren't going well for our main character. At the end, they get their happily ever after, 
and the person who is doing the bullying gets their comeuppance. Again, usually their primary function is to entertain or to teach a lesson. And what's interesting is we have what's called folktale types, meaning there are over 700 types and traditions around the globe. And again, we'll refer back to the image I have here. This is the Cinderella type. And so what happens is we have all these independent stories that can stand on their own, yet they share some common elements. Again, in Cinderella, we have the female figure that is being persecuted in some way, not treated well, and somehow she has to overcome the obstacle. Usually the obstacle is get to the ball um, or get to the event. Sometimes she has magical um, friends that assist her, other times not. And then the ending is she gets her happily ever after. So within this, there's those common types. But even just think of how many different Cinderella type stories you know and how they're slightly all different, yet we still understand them as the Cinderella type. Another example of a common folklore is what's called the quest. And this is going to be interesting because what happens in these quests is usually this is where our common everyday person, our character, becomes something more, right? They become almost the stuff of legends. And so what a quest is, it's the common folktale type where our hero either seeks a special object, journeys to a strange land, and faces a powerful antagonist. Usually our hero needs the assistance of others. Sometimes they are magical in some way. The adversary, our antagonist, at some point captures the hero, but the hero often escapes. Usually they beat and destroy the enemy through some sort of trick. Our hero takes the object or completes the task, returns home, and is rewarded. And what we're going to look at in more detail next week is this idea of the hero. And we're going to look at Joseph Campbell's work, um, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, where he claims every hero's tale follows the same exact storyline. And we're going to look at that and explore it a little bit more. Um, our hero is often seen as a clever trickster, whereas his adversary is usually seen as brutish, stupid, and cruel. An example of this would be from Homer's The Odyssey. The Odyssey is the second tale of Homer, right? The Iliad tells the story of the 10-year Trojan War, kind of. Um, the Odyssey tells the story of Odysseus, who's one of the Greek warriors, and it tells the story of his quest to get home. It takes him another 10 years to get home, and this looks at the many challenges he must face. Now, his ultimate goal is to get home to his wife, Penelope, who is called Patient Penelope, because she's literally been waiting him for 10 years, uh, 10 years for the war and then 10 years to get home. And what happens is even in the Iliad, um, Odysseus is known for his smarts, for his coming, cunning. He's often called wily Odysseus. And so what we're going to see at the end of the Odyssey is when he tries to go home, his wife, um, because he was the king of his land, he was the leader, and his wife has been refusing to get married. And finally, the people are like, look, we need a new king. He's obviously not coming back. Everyone else who was coming back from the war is already back. He's still been gone for 10 years. And so she tells them, okay, well, I'm weaving this one thing. And once I'm finally done with it, then I'll be ready to get married. So she weaves all day, and that night she unweaves it. Well, they finally figure it out, and basically they say, okay, they're going to hold a contest, and whoever wins this contest will win her hand in marriage and become the new leader. Well, by this time, Odysseus has returned home, and he is, um, along with his son, figuring out the way to basically win this and get rid of all the suitors, the men who are trying to um, take his wife and his place as ruler. So what they do is they come up with that plan for the competition. And what you have to do is you have to shoot this arrow through a small hole or a small ring. Well, Odysseus joins the competition, but he's dressed in disguise like a beggar. And he ends up winning the competition. And then he unveils who he is. And then he's able to kill all of the suitors, all of the men who wanted to take his throne. So that's an example of our hero's journey, his quest, 
and how he uses his cunning to overcome his adversaries. All right. And then last we have this category of fairy tale. Now this is a very general category and it may include tales with fairies, giants, dragons, elves, goblin, dwarves, and other fanciful forces. However, like I've said, many scholars include these in some of the other categories, especially in the folk tale or the folklore category. A um, couple things I just wanted you to know that some people do have them as their own separate category. Uh, things I do want you to know about fairy tales is they were not originally written for children. For example, our Grimm's brothers, these tales often ended very dark and were not, as the article said, Disney-fied with these happily ever after. So an example, in the original Little Mermaid, uh, she turns into sea foam and dies. Sleeping Beauty, the prince lays with her in the biblical term. Um, why she is unconscious, and she actually has children why she is still unconscious. So basically, she is slept with without her consent. This is what we would consider rape in the modern days. And so there is a much darker side to them. Um, Cinderella, in the original tale, the, sister, the stepsisters cut off part of their feet trying to get their feet to fit into the shoes. So you see this much darker side. Um, and again, these weren't originally intended for children. Again, many scholars do not classify them as their own category, but some do, so I wanted you to be made aware of it. All right, the next two slides, I thought these were these flow charts were interesting. These are awful, also um, available to you on Blackboard, so you can upload them and see them probably a little bigger. But these little flow char charts are trying to help you decide whether something's a myth or a legend. The first one here is you start with a central theme. And what you do is you read the story and then you answer these questions. And then following the flow chart is supposed to tell you whether it's myth, folk tale, or a legend. The other one here, you start with a specific type of character. So say we did our Cinderella. Let's talk about Cinderella in the Disney version, the cartoon Disney version. So we read the story. And then are there any supernatural or magical characters? Well, in the Disney version, yes. So we go to the left. Do the characters include princesses, fairies, and wicked witches? Well, in this one, yes, we have the fairy godmother. So we go down to yes, and it tells us this is either a fairy or a folktale. Now we can look at some of the other Cinderella stories, right? Read the story. Are there supernatural or magical characters? We could say no. Sometimes it's just Cinderella figuring out how to do this on her own. Is the story about ordinary people's lives? Well, let's take the live action one, right? Maybe we don't, you know, in most of the stories, we still have a prince. Princes usually aren't seen as every day, right? So we could say no. Characters are heroes with special strengths. Okay, if we say yes, it's a myth. If we say no, it's going to go more to folktale. So you can see from these, right, that the same story, the same story type can actually give us different results. And that's why I want you to see with both of these charts, why they may give you some guidance. Not everything is 100%. And even the categories that we've already looked at are not 100%. We're going to see sometimes some gray or some squishy areas. All right, well, let's now move on to these creation or origin myths or origin stories. And so I had you read the very short article called Why Do We Have Creation Myths? And this was from The Guardian. And basically what happens is almost all cultures believe the world was created in some way. And therefore, we need a story to explain how this creation occurred. And so for this, the article mentions, right, there's basically one small tribe that they found that doesn't have a creation story. Pretty much every other culture or society in known existence has some sort of creation story. Why? Because we want answers. We want to know how our world came to being. And we often look for cause and effect even when there isn't one why we want answers, right? The effect obviously was our world was created. Well, what caused it? 
we don't know, right? We do not still have any definitive proof, but since the existence of man time, we've been trying to figure it out. In fact, we will accept a bad explanation instead of no explanation at all. And I like this quote from the article. It says, we naturally ask where the world came from. And in the absence of any reliable way of discovering the real answers, we make a best guess, which usually means describing cosmic creation in ways similar to more familiar forms, such as birth or the act of a purposive inventor. So birth, something we're all familiar with. We know how humans get here, right? We're born. And so this idea that the, you know, our world was somehow born from something else. Or this idea of a purposive inventor, meaning the world was invented on purpose, that somebody had a plan and that they intentionally created the world. It wasn't just a happy, you know, happenstance that things scientifically worked out. So again, done on purpose and not accident. And now we can look at these different origin stories or creation myths, and we're going to have different mythologists, meaning those who study myths, who've applied different categories or tried to classify these creation stories. And what we're going to look at here, I, I like this one, because they divide them up into five main categories of creation stories. The first is what's called ex nihilo, which literally means from nothing. And so this idea, this is where creation is through the thought, word, dream, or bodily secretions of a divine being. Literally, the divine being creates the world from nothing. And think about this. Think about your three monotheistic religions. It is this way. In Catholicism, we have Genesis, right, Who tell, which tells you the story of God literally creating the world. And so this is out of nothing, we have the world that is being created. The second is what's called the earth diver. And this is a creation in which a diver, usually some sort of bird or amphibian, literally is sent by the creator. And there's this kind of just think of it as like an ocean, a primordial ocean of just being, right, of stuff. And what happens is this diver literally dives into this primordial ocean of, of stuff and brings some of this up with them. Um, think of it almost as like diving into, you know, the ocean and coming up with algae and water and sand and mud and what happens is they take this and they develop it into the physical world itself. The third is what's called emergent myths. All right, the third, sorry, I had to pause for the fire trucks. Third is what's called emergent myths. These are myths in where we have some sort of ancestor, parent, some forefather figure. What happens is they pass through a series of worlds that are outside of our own, because again, ours hasn't existed yet. And basically they go in through these different metamorphoses until they reach this new world, right? This new world, which is our present world. So literally they merge through the other ones into it. The fourth is creation by dismemberment of some, of some sort of primordial being, right? So this primordial being Within this, there's two different types. First is what we call the parent myth. And this is where we often have some sort of pair, right, that are the parents. Don't uh, limit yourself to gender binaries, right? It doesn't have to be male, female. We, in fact, they can be completely sexless figures. But we have these two parent primordial beings, and somehow they are separated or split. And because of this, one form this split, um, the universe or our world is created from this when the two are pulled apart. Um, the two parents are commonly identified as sky and earth, who in a prime, uh, prime, prime, primeval state are so tightly bound to each other that no offspring could emerge. Yet when they're separated, right, sky and earth, then we get the creation of the world. The second is um, the second form of the, the dismemberment from a world parent myth. 
Basically, creation itself springs from dismembered parts of the body of one of the primeval beings. Often this can be, you know, limbs, hair, blood, bones, organs. Somehow they are removed, they're dismembered from the body, and because of this, it creates its own world. All right, and then the last one, this is probably one of the most common ones, except for the ex nihilo. This is where it comes from chaos. And so creation happens by this idea that the universe, that reality was in chaos, meaning disorder. Um, it's basically a formless expanse. And what happens is some being, some thing, some entity comes and takes this chaos and forms it into some sort of order, order leading, literally meaning cosmosis. And this order is seen as a good thing, right? Chaos is seen as bad, evil, right? It's the idea of oblivion. And when we have the order, we have order in it, we having this, this um, order coming from disorder, that creates the world. Often we're also going to see in this, there is also another side to it, that there's always the chance that our world could become disordered and fall back into chaos. Now again, this is just one uh, uh, system where mythologists have categorized these into five different categories. There are some that have nine categories. There are some that have six different categories. Again, this is not an exact science, but I like this one because it covers most of our creation stories. And that brings us to the next thing. This is an activity that you will be doing this week. So what you'll have to do um, on the slides that I've also posted on Blackboard, you'll have to go to this slide. You won't be able to click on it in this lecture. But click on this, and this is an um, activity that the Khan Academy has set up where we're looking at these origin stories. So once you click on this, um, if you were in class, you saw it, but obviously I can't do it for the lecture, you'll go to this page. And what I want you to do is I have also included on Blackboard um, an activity sheet. You can either print it out and fill it out, or you can try to fill it out online, but somehow you're going to have to return it back to me. If you are taking in-person classes, you can turn it in in class. If you are taking this online, you'll need to somehow get it to me um, uh, through Blackboard. I'll put up where you can post it. All right, so what I want you to do is to print out that worksheet, which will be, and you'll see it's on the link on Blackboard. And what you're going to do is right here it talks about, the Khan Academy talks about these origin stories. And they say, everywhere around the world, people tell stories about how the universe began and how humans came into being. Scholars, namely anthropologists and ethnologists, call these tales creation myths or origin stories. Some origin stories are based on real people and events, while others are based on more imaginative accounts. Origin stories can contain powerful emotional symbols that convey profound truths but not necessarily any literal sense. And so what you're going to do is you can see on the side here, to the left, there are eight different origin stories. And so what I want you to do is take your chart, your activity sheet, and you're going to either read or watch all eight of these, and I want you to fill the sheet out. Now this needs to be your own original work and not copied from any outside sources, or even any sources within the Khan Academy. I want you to listen or read these and fill it out. And so what you're going to look for here, right, we have eight different origin stories. You have the modern scientific, Chinese, Judeo-Christian, Iroquois, 